Hi, I'm Lucas Roberts. <laughs> so, Lucas, who knew me? He takes care of Bessie Linux. Uh, so, uh, we're going to be talking today about Bessie Linux and containers. And, um, you know, I'm a big believer in Bessie Linux being the greatest thing for containers. It's an American expression, but Bessie Linux and containers go together like peanut butter and jelly. Um, but basically, it's a perfect combination of two things. But we're going to go through that in a minute. SE Linux is an expert at protecting the host file system uh, from the containers, right? So we want to make sure that the container doesn't break out onto the file system and, and, and attack the file system. Uh, so that's really what SE Linux sort of explains that. Uh, so the best tool for that, uh, in my belief, is SE Linux. So have you done my presentation before? Oh, it's like being in church. Anything in red, you've got to say. Got it? <laughs> Perfect, it's working. Exactly SE Linux policy right here. Allow a cat process to eat, permission to eat, cat chow in the category of food. Then we write a rule that says allow a dog to eat dog food. Okay? Everything's denied by default. We write these rules. Then the cat is able to eat the cat food, and the dog is able to eat the dog food. The cat can get more from the kernel, gets us more cat food. But when the dog tries to eat the cat food, the kernel steps in and blocks it. Okay? That is what type enforcement is. In the SE Linux world, we're talking about, we label containers. We're talking about containers here. So we basically, type enforcement protects the host from the container processes. We have container processes. We actually allow container processes to execute and read stuff that's under slash shoes. The reason for that is when I, a lot of people volume out in things from the host operating system, from the host user into the container. But they're not allowed, the container process, they're not allowed to write to slash user, just able to read, but that's by default policy. Container process, only able to write to container files. These are the types that we use. So this is the cat, and this is the cat food. So we label a container process as container T, and we label a file type of the container as container file T. The only thing in the world that a container is allowed to write to is container file T. Okay, the, the only file logic is allowed to write to. Most container write, runtime CVEs, containers, breakout of the file system have been, have been blocked. This CVE, blocked by SE Linux. 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 Those are the five that I found this morning. Okay? Almost every single breakout of container runtimes has been a file system attack. They've figured out a way to break out to the file system. A couple of examples of those. Run C had a 
open file descriptor. If I had created a container, exactly into a container, and I brought an open file descriptor with me, the process inside the container could attack that open file descriptor. They could get out of that open file descriptor to the file on the file system, and then they could start attacking the file system. Another example, slash on the host operating system is a well-known entity. And uh, what was happening is people, there's a sys call called open file app. And UA was put in, if you have to know the file system you're on, and you know the inode of the, the slash file, so you can actually open it up without worrying about not namespace. So people broke out of containers by basically getting to that slash, and then they would lock the file system. But SE Linux would step in and break, break through at that point. So we've talked so far about SE Linux type enforcement, but SE Linux, obviously, if everything in the world is a cat or everything in the world is a dog, the dogs and the cats can attack each other. So we just go with type enforcement. We have the cats, uh, the, the container T's, are able to attack the other containers. So we want to use SE Linux for separation between the containers. So type enforcement, SE Linux contains them all. What about, I already covered that. Um, so SE Linux, the second part of SE Linux is based on this thought of MLS, <coughs> multi-level security. Uh, well, years ago, when we started doing virtualization, oh, oh by the way, I'm supposed to take this shirt off. Yeah. Donald Trump would be proud of it. <laughs> uh, but uh, so the uh, basically uh, years ago, we had a, we were doing virtualization, and we created a thing called Esper. And what we did is SE Linux had this fourth field. If you ever look at the SE Linux, almost always you see it as S zero. Uh, that stands for system low in the MLS world. Well, most people never used MLS. This is like top secret, secret stuff. So we had this field in the SE Linux label, and we decided to create a new type of policy. And uh, we created a policy called MCS, multi category security. Uh, I actually have some patents on this, I'm very proud of it. My mother's very proud too. Uh, and so what we were able to do with, with MCS category, we basically said we're just going to pick random MCS categories, and then we're just going to guarantee that the MCS categories match. So based on MLS, and what we do now is we're able to say, we're able to identify the dogs. So we have dog types, and we can control a dog type attacking the host operating system, but if we can identify each, each, each container type differently, then we can have them isolated. So we're going to put an MCS label of Fido on this dog and on Spot yeah, on that, and we're going to create food. And now we can also put the same MCS label on the food objects. So it's, a, it's still a container file T object or a food object, but we're adding the FIDO to it. So I can have FIDO and Spot, and then obviously FIDO is able to eat his food, but when Spot, I mean FIDO tries to eat Spot's food, the kernel steps in. So what happens when I start a container is the container runtimes basically pick out a random MCS label. And then they assign it to all the content, and they assign it to the uh, process that launched, the first process in the container. And then basically that is how we do it. And we do the same thing with virtualization. We did it with original OpenShift. And OpenShift, original OpenShift, when these, we had millions of users, each one with separate MCS layers. Um, so that's how MCS enforcement works. So what happened when a container breaks out onto the system? We're about to show you this. So, this is a script, by the way, all the demos, if you're looking on the slides, the demos are actually listed. You can go and play with these at your leisure. So we're going to use Podman to actually launch a container. But, and here we have how you can subvert your system. So we're going to do sudo. Uh, if you run Docker with, uh, in the Docker group, you can do this and break in your system without having to be root. Uh, but we're going to do it as root. So we're doing Podman run. Um, this is just to make out my scripts look better, so I'm setting it home and by a little bit. But this is really the critical thing here. So I'm volume mounting in slash in the root host operating system onto slash host. I'm just running Fedora container. I could run any container, so we're not even going to use that. And then we're using to, to root to host to break out of the container. So basically, I am getting out to the host operating system. I'm getting out of slash. If I went ran this container, you would see I was full slash in it, and I happened to write a little script here to make this a little quicker. So I'm actually going to, when I break out, I'm going to try my breakout script to actually cause hacking to happen. So now we're going to do it, and just to show you, go another one. So uh, right here, it shows that I'm running um, at system zero. Basically, the type is here, container T, and up here we have the MCS label. And again, Podman picked that up randomly, and Podman has a whole database of containers that previously created and makes sure that it doesn't have a full, it doesn't overflow it. Um, now he basically tried to cat its shadow, its root, 
fail, touch file on the system root, he's going to go into the home directory, he's going to try to get into the SH directory, now he's going to look at a PID1 on the system, you get permission to die, now he's going to stop doing systemd communication, and now he's going to try to run a Docker container, and he's going to get permission denied, and clear. So basically, with SE Linux, again, the only thing it's allowed to do is interact with container files. Right? It's not allowed to, even if you break out as full root on the system, that's it. Now, when we run containers, this way we pick all containers run with a single type. All right? Inside the container, everything run, all the processes run as container T. What we don't have is isolation inside of the container, but that's by choice. In the microservice, uh, microservices world, we're trying to get to the point that the container does one thing. It's the Apache process. It isn't the Apache process in a database process, right? In a container world, you have the Apache process and then you have a data process. And those would be two different cats or two different dogs, right? And that's how you're supposed to do stuff in the container world. So uh, in a, another American expression, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. We want to keep you in Vegas. We don't want you breaking out to rural America, right? So this man is going to now show you how to break out to rural America. Far rural chat. So you have still some commands here. Okay. Important or not? Okay. So actually, so as I'm running those attacks, I actually have some auditing uh, to show you what's happening on the auditing subsystem. So this shows that uh, this is when I catted out Etsy Shadow. It shows that container T tried to read Etsy Shadow, and I was going to show what happens when the Docker when I try to run the Docker command. And so here you see that I was trying to connect to um, Docker daemon uh, via the Docker socket. And so in your log file, it'd be going wild at the point that these containers are broken out. So you'd have to watch your audit log file to say, uh, containers are doing something awful evil on my system uh, at this point. So I think I'm done now, right? Yep, you're done. End of demo. <laughs> OK, and this is the next generation of SM Linux experts working on their training right now. So if they can understand it, Okay, so then talk about the MCAs and let's uh, look on the MCAs, uh, how it's worked with relation, uh, or how, 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 how it's worked with, uh, as, uh, specifically with the category. So let's say we have two containers, and as we can see, both the containers have the same SE Linux type, which is container underscore T. But these containers has, uh, have different categories. The first one has C1 and C2. And in the bullets here, we have uh, four objects which are labeled as container underscore file underscore t which let's say it's kind of uh, files on the system but all these uh, all these uh, categories are subsets of of the following uh, set of categories which is c1 and c2 so we can say that this category category dominance these categories and same story for uh, for a container with category c2 and c3 but Let's uh, let's talk about we, we are talking about the containers. So let's uh, let's focus just on these two. Uh, Can I break it, break it for a second? Yes, of yeah. course. So uh, one thing to think about: we picked a random, random MCS. We pick two categories by default, and we usually concentrate on two categories. He showed you dominance. That is, means that if I pick just one category, other domains can stop to dominate it. But the interesting thing: you why two categories? Well, first of all, there's 1024 categories available. So by picking two categories, I get 1024 times 1024, which is basically around a million. Okay, but you have to divide it two because C1 comma C2 is the exact same thing as C2 C2 comma C1. So that actually cuts the total number of potential containers you can run on a system to basically a half a million. So if we wanted to get more containers, eventually we find out half a million containers on a node is is not enough. We could always add a third category. But the mass gets a lot hotter at that time. So go ahead. Yeah, OK. So let's, let's look on this picture. Again, two containers <coughs> with the same SE Linux type, container underscore T, uh, but uh, different categories, C1 and C2. That's one set. And second one is C2 and C3. So if we have three objects on the system, again, with the same SE Linux label, which is container underscore file underscore T, but there are different categories. So this container can access the, let's say, this, 
this first object. Why? Because there is an allow rule saying that container T can access container file T, but also the the this uh, these two uh, this set of categories are, is subset of the categories of, of the process. So uh, C1 and C2 can access C, C1 and C2 object, and also uh, this file can use containers for the sharing because there is a there is a no 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 specific category which is again the subset. And same story with the same story with the second container with category C2 and C3. So this is this is way how how containers can can share access to same direct, uh, same object on the system. And this is the similar picture just showing that what is not allowed that a container with, uh, with label container underscore T with, uh, with category C2 and C3 cannot access object file with categories C1 and C2 and same story for a container with categories C1 and C2. So uh, container engines like uh, let's say Podman can uh, have, have, reliable, uh, have a reliable feature so if you if you mounting, for example, we, we have example here, and after the mount points, you put semicolon with capital Z. Uh, that what will happen? The the podman will relabel the mount point on, on the on the file system as container underscore file underscore t, but with the specific but with the specific uh, categories, which means that only this container can access the file on the on the host system. Uh, uh, next uh, option is uh, use the small or, or let's say normal Z, and which means that uh, Podman will also relabel the the mount point on, 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 on the file system, but it will label as container underscore file underscore T, which means that both both containers executed in in in, uh, in second command and also in last command can uh, can access with the object. Uh, labeled as container underscore file underscore t on the system. So what's, we, we have some problems with this, of course, because we are using just one uh, SLinux policy for, for containers, which is default, the default label or default type, which is container underscore, underscore t. And in some situation, this type is really strict. For example, uh, Fedora Silverblue proje uh, project needs containers to read write home directories. And second, uh, second case is FluentD project needs two containers to be able to read log files in slash var slash log directory. On the other hand, we have situation when container underscore t type is, is uh, too loose for, uh, for certain use cases, which is no, uh, which is no SLinux network controls. It means that container, container p can bind on any port uh, any network port, sorry. And also, uh, there is a no control on Linux capabilities, which means that a container uh, T uh, can use all the cap all uh, Linux capabilities. So, what's the cur current solution for these problems? The first one is to use the relabeling uh, feature. Uh, for example, if you want to start FluentD inside the container, you can relabel uh, slash var slash log uh, to have label container file underscore t with a specific uh, with a specific uh, categories, which is of course the bad idea because uh, var log uh, directory gets uh, container underscore file with a, with set of two categories, and other confined tools no longer will be able to access slash var slash log, which is which is not good. Yeah. And second solution is turn SLinux uh, off for the container, which is of course bad idea. And my question is why it is bad idea? Anything? It's like putting set before zero. Yeah, and what does it mean? What does it mean? It means that container can break out anyway. Yes, and there is one more important thing. Then we'll be set, come on. <laughs> So, uh, and now I propose you another solution, and or the another solutions can be write the SLinux policy for the container from the scratch. 
which is too difficult for system administrator because it's time consuming and you need to, and you need to have deep uh, uh, Selenux expertise. Second option is to add additional Selenux rules to container underscore T using the uh, custom module, which is still not ideal because uh, you need to have this Selenux expertise and, all, and these additional rules will apply for all containers, which is things what, what you probably don't want. So there was a request of creating these custom policies for the, for the different team for their containers and uh, the SLinux team and also the containers team had a lot of requests with please could you write SLinux policy for our container because we need to access uh, home directories. Same story for Warlock. And as you know, this is, this is, non, this is non long term solution. And in SLinux team we realized that, that the, we always give one policy and then there will be another team ask for another policy. So it's like we, gave, we, we give, some team, uh, give some team just the fish. And I like this saying that if you give a man fish, he is angry again in one hour. If you teach him to catch a fish, you do him a good term. So in SL Linux team, we created a tool called Udica, which is fishing root in my native language. I'm Slovak. So we really call it Udica. And it's, it's fishing root. And, Right now, I teach you how to, how to use the phishing route to write your own SLinux policy. So, Ujitsa is tool for generating SLinux security profiles for containers. So, we will have one really easy example. We will have example container, and this container is mounting a slash home uh, with uh, read and write permissions, mounting a slash var slash pool for read only, and exposing FTP port TCP21. So general as Linux, uh, general policy container underscore T cannot write as then mentioned and or, or read for <coughs> slash home and also cannot read slash bar slash pool. On the other hand, the container underscore T can expose all the ports. So let's generate as Linux policy for this container. Okay. Okay, so we have SLinux in enforcing, just to be sure. And I will start the first container, mounting slash home with read write permissions and uh, mounting slash var slash pool with, with read only and exposing port 21. Okay, so we are here. On the right side, we can check for the SLinux label of the container, which is container underscore T, which is the uh, generic uh, type for containers and two categories. And uh, as I told you, the uh, container underscore T cannot access, uh, cannot access uh, a slash home and slash bar spool. Uh, I will prove it to you. Uh, CD home LS permission denied as expected and slash var slash spool ls permission denied as expected on the right side we see a uh, sc search tool i'm trying to query for allow rules uh, when uh, process is labeled as container t and object is labeled as uh, home underscore root underscore t or var underscore spool underscore t and there are no allow rules on the other hand important abc uh, important allow rule is over there the container t can uh, by, uh, by on all port types. So with Podman PS we can check for container ID which in future uh, we need to use. So I put it here to have complete demo. And this is the most important command of, of, uh, of this talk which is the Podman inspect minus L which means, which means the last container. So the last container will be, uh, will be inspected and and Udica will create the uh, SLinux policy named my underscore container. So I executed it and policy is created. Uh, we need to do two things. First one is uh, load the all needed, all needed modules. And second one, we need to restart the container with, uh, with another parameter, which is the security label and security label is my underscore container dot process. That will be labeled for container, for running container. So 
policy is loaded using the SE module minus E. Okay, I start the second container uh, with, the, with the security label, as I told you, which is the my underscore container dot process. Again, let's check for the label of the container, and it's my container dot process instead of generic container underscore T. So, again, let's check if I can access a slash home. And as you can see, I can access it. It was mounted as uh, read-write, so for example, let's touch this directory, it's working, and let's check access for our spool, and again, it's working. On the right side, again, we see SE search, uh, search queries, and we see that we have already existing uh, allow rules loaded in the kernel. And then please also show that uh, my container dot process can uh, bind only on FTP port T, as you can see. Okay, so that was the demo. So right now we generate S Linux policy and we can read and write to slash home. Uh, you, uh, we can uh, read slash var slash pool, expose the FTP TCP port without writing any allow rule. So how it works under the hood? The concept is based on block inheritance seal language, <coughs> which I show you in next slide. And Udica creates the policy combinings, combines something what we call blocks, or we can call it also templates, by inspecting container JSON file and the widgets are looking for uh, mounts, ports, and capabilities. Because as Dan mentioned, what happened in Vegas, it stays in Vegas. So from, from host, we see a container as a, as a, block, as a, as a black box. And we are, care about, uh, we are care about just the interaction with container and the host system. So all these, uh, all these allow rules are combined with a, with a default template. We, we call it the base underscore container, and it's required for for every it's required for every policy based on uh, Udica generated policy. So the first block is allowing read and uh, exec slash user and read some configuration files. Then we need net container for allowing network access. And last thing, we need uh, uh, a, a block which we can call home for accessing uh, home directories. As I mentioned, uh, base is required for every container. Uh, we need net block for uh, allow binding on FTP port 21. And last one, we are allowing uh, read and write uh, home dears. That's the, 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 these are the blocks we, we which use. And as you can see on the right side, we inherit all the allow rules from these three blocks and build my underscore container policy. But there is also one more block, which is spool block. We don't have any default uh, block for slash bar slash spool. And that's the reason why I used uh, this path, that if there is a situation when Udica detects that there is no default block, uh, Udica uh, will check the S Linux database, what uh, what labels can be inside the, inside the path, in this, situ in this case it's slash var slash spool, and create all the allow rules for it, and add it to my container, uh, my container uh, block. So this generated policy can be used with multiple container runtimes, such as Podman, Docker, Buildag, and last but not <coughs> least in the, with the Kubernetes. So these are the Udica uh, repositories. The first one, the, we, we have sources there. And in second one, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a proof of concept uh, how these blocks work. So if you are interested, uh, feel free to, to read it. Also, Udica is already available in federal repositories. So all you need to do is just DNF install Udica. And message of the day is that you can generate custom S Linux policy for your containers with one simple command called Udica, which is phishing root. Of course, so, I don't pronounce it Udica, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so these are the, all, the, uh, all the slides. 
uh, information and blog posts from uh, Dan and the rest of the SLinux. So there's team. a link to the slides if you want to just get the slides, you can get them from there. Um, every demo that we're showing today, we've actually created a demos repo. So anybody wants to play with any of these repo, anything, what we're trying to do is encourage anybody that goes to GitHub containers, if you want to play with any of the tools there, there's those people <coughs> so a demonstration that you can take home <coughs> with you or take to your local host and run it. So demonstrations, yes, the Linux breakout, somebody on a, the, the other talk, I'm sure he's going to be opening up a pull request after this to put it up in demos. Yeah. Um, so you can actually see how to play with uh, uh, Utica. Um, if you want to interest more, more in Podman, um, this is where if you want to look, if anybody's really interested in container SE Linux, which is where container T is defined, um, that's also a repo up there. Um, and then uh, the, the stuff that he's done uh, uh, for the customizations is there. Um, and those are all blog stocking where people talk about SE Linux. So at this point, we open it up at the questions. That was a bit too fast. Yeah. Everybody thinks this is perfect. Yeah. What? Uh, actually, uh, bring up do the Podman inspective to show them what the JSON looks like. That's what we're reading. Yes. Go yeah. Ahead. So what's next? What's next? I I, I think we're going to have people play with this. Um, and some of the stuff is sort of high DS templates because, uh, for instance, logs. He didn't show logs even though we talked about fluid D needing it. So the the problem is in certain directories there are lots and lots of types. So. Uh, that's why he has a block that looks at content in the home directory. Um, well, that's a real big, you know, this is probably 50 different types in the home directory. So you have to, he has to sort of hide code the types that are both home directory similar to file log. So I think what we'll be looking at, uh, the three situations we've been hit with recently were home directory, file log, and NCDKI. So people want to be able to share the, the certificate systems into the, those, those are three that I know of, but I think in the future we're going to be hitting, you know, people want web services shared to the container or they want, you know. Uh, so I, I think as we evolve, we'll evolve, to, you know, additional, type, additional types for that. Because I really hate the fact that right now I have to tell people to disable SC Linux for container separation. I never tell anybody they have to dis disable SC Linux. Um, so this is a really nice tool for that. But let's uh, bring up. Uh, well, you want to see inspect, Podman inspect. <coughs> so we want to show you what what he's looking at. So back to us. So in this is basically every all the information you want. So here he here he's looking at the mounts and he's looking for what's he, he knows what the default mounts are. But if he sees a bind mount from the host, he sees slash home, and so he knows that's going to trigger his home block. Um, he's built in, so he's not worried about those. Uh, but he gets down to, so he's only looking at bind mounts. Go down to the capabilities. Uh. By the way, why are we so, I, I would like to answer a question. Why are we so loose versus tight? You know, some, some ways we're too tight, some ways we're too loose. The pr reason we're loose on network networks and capabilities is because people in the Podman command or the Docker command can change really easily which capabilities are available in the container and which ones are not. And we can't, Podman, the, the, the container types, the rest of the Linux types are sort of hot coded. And we don't want to have you know, 32 different SC Linux types for each capability. There's no way to like, generate the policy on the fly. Um, although he's shown a fairly good example of generating policy on the fly. Um, so same thing with networks, right? We have no idea inside of the container which ports you're going to be binding to, so we have a real hard time figuring out. So we have fairly loose on capabilities. We allow other parts of the kernel to control capabilities, set off and, and regular capability dropping, and we allow networks to be controlled by firewalls. But this allows us to actually enforce it by the SMAs. You got a question? Yeah. yeah uh, so basically, we're using uh, container description using Podman uh, inspect mm -hmm. and generating some kind of policies. Have you ever thinking about including this functionality to Podman itself? Because it looks more logical. When you're defining this in Podman and running container, you define the same solutions initially. Well, I don't think I don't think Podman should be generating. I mean, maybe we could add a dash dash generate um, policy flag or something like that. But 
I, I think I, I hate to make bottom in like the, the tool that really understands SC Linux. So, uh, I'd rather leave that. I think it, what he's done sort of is the traditional Unix way of, of being able to generate based on output. And so I, 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 I hesitate to add this directly to, to um, in, in some cases. In some cases, I think the colon Z is a better idea than doing this, right? So just because I volume mount in, if I volume mount in slash home slash dwalsh slash foobar, I would rather than use the colon Z in that case. This is more when I want to volume in huge file systems that I really, in fact, SE Linux, uh, the podman, uh, the SE Linux Golang libraries now will block you from relabeling slash home, will block you from relabeling. I mean, some people put slash, uh, as we showed in the breakout, if you do a podman slash slash host and then put a colon Z in it, Podman's going to try to relabel the entire file system, mm -hmm. right? So it's really easy for users to make mistakes. But in, in the case you do a private directory, we really, really should lock it down to only the capabilities, so they only the only labels. Yeah, this was discussed in the past, and we decided that we will have a standalone tool yeah. for it. Yeah. You showed that you can have a, a simpler label without the ability to share content with these two containers. But what if I want to share content only to those two containers and not the others? How do you do that? Yeah, I think that, that would be an enhancement to Utica, that basically to tell it to create a new type for sharing containers. So perhaps perhaps we could look for the colon Z in there, and you know, maybe there's a flag to Utica that says generate a special type for you know, the volumes yes. or something. And that, that, to me, would be a decent thing. Because Right now, we, are, we have two choices. Either the thing is totally separated or every container in the universe can read it right now. So the thing would be to create, if we created a new type, say, you know, my container private T, and then <coughs> the right rule, he could have rules that still that says his, container, his new container process can read and write and execute uh, anything that is my shared container T. Now if I ran two containers or whatever. I'll be, I'll be great for, for any ideas we, we do, Jitsa, so uh, please feel free to, uh, to create some issue on, on GitHub and that will be perfect. That's good. Yeah. Anybody else? I thought someone else yeah. uh, did. Are there any exceptions to because of the support that we have for the user? Yes, but they are different. If I understand your question, you are asking if it's a good idea to just uh, inspect the container and allow everything was in, inside the container without the knowledge what I'm allowing, right? Yeah. Well, but we're really looking at, we're really look, as he explained, we're really looking at content from the host that is getting linked into the container. So, so binding to pause is sort of a host concept. Um, volume mounting in is a host concept. Um, most of the other stuff that's in the inspection is not really host concepts. It just, I mean, most of the stuff doesn't, you know, it's basically sort of if, if someone specified an initial IP address, there's not an SMS control on that. Mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting to look through here, maybe to find if there's additional things we could lock on. But yeah, I think he got that the primary one. But isn't this a case exactly for not having this by default done automatically by Podman, but having the tools, tools separated? So the admin can be the other one to generate the policy. Right. Then the user can try to do whatever they want in the definition and the policy will block them. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it's interesting. We built in the wiring for everybody to be able to pass types down. All, these, all the container engines do it, build a five minute marker. Everybody does it. Um, and it's built into Kubernetes. So if the only problem is going to be you'd have to use some kind of operator or, um, or uh, demon set to make sure that this policy gets installed in all your folks. So, so we, we still uh, we did uh, bring uh, containers in part with a handmade uh, 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 policy reader for the host. Yeah. So, so we can do exactly the same things that we would have written in, in the host policy. Well, I mean, I, I would figure like Fluent D, the example of Fluent D right now has to run unconfined by SC Linux. Now they can write their own policy fairly easily that they know what they want. And without them having to be SC Linux experts, they really all they say is, I want to read everything by law, generate policy for me. Now they, it's their job now to take their policy and tell OpenShift, I need this installed on all the machines that we run fluent in. Right? In the, in the example of, of the desktop, Silver Blue, they would probably generate their, this policy and, and, and 
install it for people running on Silver Blue. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then, uh, so there's a thing called Toolbox. I don't know if you've heard of Toolbox. Toolbox right now is totally on lockdown by SE Linux, and they might want to take a look at all, all they really care about is that slash home is, is you know, the home directory shit to the container and not be able to do anything there. But they really don't want that thing being able to execute sudo and do other things on the host. They might want to generate their own policy and put it in the toolbox so that they, they run the SE Linux environment for home directory. Any other questions? Could this be used with something like Flatpak? Uh, yes. Well, yes, it can be. Yeah, yeah Flatpak, Flatpak right now, Flatpak, sadly, at this point, has very little sandboxing in it. Um, and and that's, there's reasons for that. It, it, the, the ultimate goal of Flatpak, uh, for those that don't really not know what Flatpak is, are you talking gibberish? Only one person doesn't know. Even a red hat is almost a blind color. Uh, <laughs> your head out of the uh, <laughs> um, So Flatpak is a, a, is a way to run desktop applications in a container format. Uh, so you want to run Firefox, you want to run um, uh, I don't know, Eclipse or whatever. And so what they've done um, is they, they've sandboxed applications. Now you can run the same version of Firefox on four different operating systems. And, uh, it's different than sort of pod name containers in that they have a different format that they're shipping with. Um, but what, what you really want is you want Firefox eventually <coughs> to be isolated from home directory. So um, yeah, I, what I would want is I want my Firefox not to be able to read my .sh keys by default and not be able to, to say, attack other nodes, you know, a rogue process inside of Firefox that would read those uh, .sh. And what the, the goal eventually of, of Flatpak would be to have any time I do it, you know, obviously Firefox has to read stuff in my home directory once in a while if I want to upload an image to the internet or if I want to download a file, I want that to end up in my home directory. But usually that's indicated by a user, right? You go to, say, the save button and say, I want to save a file. And you go to the button that says open a file, you, you want to open a file. Um, and what they're going to eventually do in the desktop is have that, that thing that loads files be a separate application. And then that file, the, the file loader will read the file and basically op give an open file descriptor, some version of an open file descriptor, to the thing that's in the container. And now also you can have applications running on the desktop that are isolated from your home directory. Um, but right now Flatback doesn't do that. Once we have that, we can start to look at wrapping it with SM Linux. But right now it's basically it needs everything. Uh, Wayland also helps that as well. Yeah. Years ago I wrote a thing called Sandbox. The X Wing out of the, the, the C Linux sandbox. And that basically was closer to sort of what Podman does nowadays uh, for doing confinement. But hopefully, eventually, Flatback will do that. Anybody else? <coughs> yes? I mean, I'm not in the like, uh, directory, which operation are you allowed to, for example, executive are allowed for the directory from home or no? Can I exec a file? Where, where does the file exist? Um, I have a from US The only place that can take container T can only execute files that are underneath slash user or that are in the container. And that's just so you can buy it. So you can do a dash V of slash user P trace, which is what I always do because P trace never exists inside of my container. So if I want to use a bin P trace into my container that's running, into a running container, then I can basically you know, stop P tracing or pinning and things like that. Um, of course, that's a little shaky doing that because you have to rely on the shared libraries inside the image to work. But, uh, so for that use case, we, did, we decided slash user is pretty much not a place where you write your secrets. So we allow you to read and execute slash user. You're not allowed to write to slash user. But everything else, the only place you're able to write is container files. Anybody else? Everybody thoroughly understand it? I have no coloring books to hand out, so I mean, too heavy to bring. <laughs> All right, you guys get 15 minutes back or five minutes back. Right? Thanks for coming.